Well, I am just delighted to extend a virtual, but nonetheless, very warm welcome to the family and friends of Professor Emeritus Michael J. Trebilko, our alumni, generous donors, and those of you celebrating U of T reunion this weekend. Welcome to you all. I hope that everybody's been keeping well and safe. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Well, Michael is undoubtedly one of the faculty's most prominent scholars, his tenure with the faculty spanning nearly 50 years of scholarship, mentorship, and service. An internationally renowned and innovative scholar of law and economics, international trade law, competition law, economic and social regulation, and contract law and theory, Michael continues to be celebrated across the academy for his scholarly work, his inspiring teaching, his graduate student mentoring, and his university-wide citizenship and overall dedication to the profession. On a personal note, Michael, I've always appreciated the kindness and humor you radiate and your persuasiveness. I remember well getting a call from you when I was being recruited to the faculty. And I'd already received a number of calls from colleagues at that point. And it was very clear that intelligence was being passed along from caller to caller. You were the closer. You clearly knew that leaving Vancouver and the easy access to nature was an issue for me at the time. And so you did a remarkable job extolling the virtues of north of Toronto farm country. It was very persuasive. Well, 20 some years later, I still haven't bought a farm in and around Flesherton but I've never made a better choice than to yield to what you call the full court press and come to UFT, UFT law. But enough from me, I would like to invite the Honorable Frank Iacobucci, Dean Emeritus of the Faculty of Law and retired justice from the Supreme Court of Canada to share a few words. Frank, please. Thank you very much, Jutta. Uh, well, friends, it's, it is a, Indeed, for me, uh, an honor and delight uh, to pay tribute to Michael on this richly deserved celebration of his career. Uh, but to have a time limit of a few minutes to do so makes the assignment nearly impossible when one thinks of the enormous reach of Michael's contributions. My perspective on Michael is, a, as, a friend, is as a friend, a colleague, and a consumer of his many contributions. I first met him some 50 years ago on his joining the Toronto's, Toronto's Faculty of Law, and it was fondness at first sight. The Kiwi with the intriguing surname and his Aussie spouse, Jan, formed as we soon learned an Anzac duo of immense talents. He does a fabulous imitation because of his love for country music of, uh, of, of the great uh, singer, Johnny Cash. The trouble is uh, his New Zealand accent, accent covers up the lyrics. Over the years, our fondness for the Jan and Michael grew into esteem and love for an amazing couple. Michael's academic curiosity led him to take risks of investment in learning and study much more about economics and other disciplines he believed were important in fully understanding not only law, but also more enlightened societal policy choices. As we all know, and as was mentioned by the Dean, he was the distinguished founding pioneer of law and economics in Canada, 
garnering prizes, awards, distinctions, and acclaim nationally and internationally. But I wish to recognize the truly remarkable record of, my, of Michael, for which there is no specific academic award, and that is the unalloyed excellence Michael has achieved in every component and aspect of what it is to be the best of an academic. Michael has been a superb and innovative teacher. He has supervised more graduate students than anyone in a law school. His service to the faculty and the university is unsurpassed. His eclectic scholarship has been widely acknowledged as outstanding. His record of mentorship has led droves of his students and research assistants to become judicial law clerks, academics, judges, and leaders in the profession. And no one could be a better collegial colleague and no dean or president could have a better advisor than Michael. In short, he has a breathtaking combination of qualities that are rarely found in one individual. All those qualities he generously applied to the betterment of people and society. And with all this, Michael's humility, humor, and humanity have never altered. What did change as a result of his efforts, as a result of his efforts, was the law and its understanding, the administration of justice, more enlightened public policy decisions, and as previously mentioned, the lives of so many who benefited from his teaching, scholarship, support, service, and friendship. Michael, congratulations on the recognition you received today. But we all know it is only a small installment of payment on what is really an irreparable debt of gratitude that the faculty, university, and legal education owe you. We on this call and all your many admirers and friends rejoice and give thanks for all that you have done. Bless you always, dear friend. Thank you so much, Frank. As demonstrated by your very fitting words and the attendance this afternoon, almost 100 participants at this point, the generosity of former colleagues, students and friends, Michael is not only one of the most renowned scholars of our faculty, but also one of its most beloved. This unprecedented level of support and honor of a faculty member is both heartwarming and inspiring. The gifts made in Michael's honor will have a lasting impact on future generations of scholars and students alike, people who will be able to follow in his footsteps for generations to come. It is my great pleasure to officially announce the Michael J. Trebilco Chair in Law and Economics and the Michael J. Trebilco Law and Economics Program. These benefactions not only provide funding for our renowned Law and Economics Program, but they also enhance the international recognition and stature of the program and the faculty members who focus their academic pursuits in this space. One of the great honors that can be bestowed on an academic to be awarded is to be awarded a name chair that was established in honor of a giant in their field. With that in mind, I'm so pleased to welcome Professor Albert Yoon, the inaugural Michael J. Trebilco Chair in Law and Economics, who will be joining Michael in what promises to be an engaging discussion, exploring key insights from Law and Economics and the impact on the broader legal system. 
Albert received his undergraduate degree from Yale and his law and doctoral degrees from Stanford. During law school, he was the senior articles editor of the Stanford Law Review. After graduation, he clerked for the Honorable uh, Guy Cole of the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and was a Robert Wood Johnson Scholar in Health Policy Research at UC Berkeley. Before joining the Faculty of Law, Albert was Professor of Law at Northwestern University, during which time he was also a Law and Public Affairs Fellow at Princeton University and a Russell Sage Visiting Scholar in New York City. Most recently, Albert was Associate Dean Research and Curriculum for a two-year term ending last June. Beyond his academic career, Albert is co-founder of Blue Jay Legal, the company behind tax foresight and employment foresight, the next generation of legal research tools that harness the power of artificial intelligence to provide instant and comprehensive answers in complex areas of tax, labor, and employment law. And well, Michael, he needs no introduction, but Michael J. Trebilco graduated from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand in 1962 with an LLB and completed his LLM at the University of Adelaide in 1965. There you can see the Aussie connection coming in. He joined the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto in 1972. He was a fellow in law and economics at the University of Chicago Law School, twice a visiting professor of law at Yale Law School, a global law professor at New York University Law School, and a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. He is the recipient of countless awards and distinctions. In 1987, he was elected Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He was appointed a university professor, the University of Toronto's highest honor in 1990. In 1999, Professor Tabilko received an honorary doctorate of laws in laws from McGill University and was awarded the Canada Council Molson Prize in Humanities and Social Sciences. In the same year, he was elected honorary foreign fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2002, Michael was elected president of the American Law and Economics Association. In 2003, he received an honorary doctorate in laws from the Law Society of Ontario. He was recipient of the Ontario Attorney General's Mundell Medal in 2007. In 2010, he was the recipient of the Ontario Premier's Discovery Award for Social Sciences. I could go on, but instead, please join me in welcoming Michael and Albert. Over to you. Excellent, uh, thanks very much. Um, so uh, before we start our fireside chat, I just want to say uh, thank you to Dean Brene and thank you for uh, Priscilla for organizing this. Um, I know that uh, we've already discussed of some of Michael's uh, scholarly contributions and they're vast. You know, there's contracts, competition, trade, uh, regulation, law and development, immigration, legal profession. And those are just some of the primary categories, not even extending to all of the areas that Michael has written about. But to look at Michael's uh, scholarly contributions in some ways is to give short shrift to the real institutional contribution that he's made to the law school. Uh, he's been the mentor to countless students, many of whom have become his colleagues on the faculty. And this is just a few people, uh, George Chirantes, Kevin Davis, Ron Daniels, Ed Yacobucci, Emily Satterswaite, uh, Andrew Green, Ben Allery, Rory Gillis, uh, Anita Anand. And those are just a few who have become academics and this is a super long list, I could go on and on. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to say before we start the Fireside chat is that uh, Michael has created this really big tent in law and economics. And I think it's, it, you can't really uh, understate that, uh, overstate that importance rather, his ability to support all of us in the research that we do, even if it's not uh, the, type, the type of research that he might be pursuing himself. And so I think this type of um, Catholic approach to uh, the discipline uh, is part of what makes salon economics um, so successful. When we think about um, the strength that we have in law and economics, some of it has to do with the allure of the subject. Of course, it's, it's an interesting um, way to approach the law, but I think a lot of credit has to go to Michael in the way that he has fostered uh, all of our development on the faculty, irrespective of our level of seniority. 
Okay, so with that, I want to jump into the fireside chat. And so, Michael, I'm going to tip my hand just a little bit and say that I want to ask three questions, one relating to the past, one to the present, and one to the future. And I'm hoping that, you know, we can do this in, you know, your typical succinct fashion so that we can leave time for the Q&A. And I know that there'll be a lot of Q&A during this time. So let me just jump into the, to the past a bit. You know, if I can ask you just to pick, you know, one single thing from your vast uh, contributions, uh, what do you think is your greatest scholarly contribution? Mm, that's a tough uh, question. Um, it, probably a, a relatively recent book, uh, Dealing with Losers, uh, subtitled uh, The Political Economy of Policy Transitions, where across a wide range of policy domains, I argue that unless we're attentive to the impact of generally uh, socially desirable changes on the losers from these changes, the changes may never occur, right? They'll be obstructed by the user, uh, the losers, or, or uh, alternatively, uh, uh, the impact is simply unfair. So, dealing with losers, I I think is something that we um, we too often neglect. The climate change policy is a good example of this. There'll be clearly losers from effect of climate change policies, and we have to be highly attentive to. The adverse impact on them if we want to deal with them fairly and if we want to mitigate efforts on their part to obstruct desirable policy changes. And, and just um, on that point, do you think that you know some of the coordination or the collective action challenges that you just alluded to and say with climate control or cl climate change, do you think that that's something that um, has always, you know, that phenomenon has always existed or do you think just in light of you know, the way things have evolved over the last, you know, 10, 20 years that, you know, a lot of these problems are much more uh, intertwined than they used to be when you first started writing. I'm not sure about that. And in, in the book, I look at like, six or seven case studies, some of which have long um, antecedents. Um, I'm kind of critical of mainstream economics for uh, ignoring or discounting the, the need to take account of losers. That is, in a social uh, welfare framework, economists are inclined to say, well, on balance, uh, society be better off with this policy. So that's what, and that's the end of the story. Well, but it's not the end of the story for the, the, the folk who on balance are going to lose, right? They will have a sense of injustice uh, and uh, be uh, motivated often to oppose what may be beneficial policies. Right. So, well, so I, there, there are lots of domains where this happens, when right? raising the retirement age, right, the, uh, or the pen, or pension age. Um, if you do this abruptly, um, this is going to have negative impacts on folk who are close to retirement or uh, pensionable age, right? Um, so. I think there's a, a, numerous or, or trade policy, uh, trade liberalization, liberalized trade policies. Generally, this is a good idea, but there'll be losers, people who lose their jobs or industries that contract or close down. This is a, a longstanding problem. So simply say, but pretending that these impacts, negative impacts don't exist is not helpful. Well, it's interesting, right? Just if you look at some of the recent news, like for example, who comprises the board on some of these um, large uh, multinational oil companies, you know, there has been uh, attempts to, I think, address some of the issues that you talked about, you know, like by having uh, members of the board who are interested in some of the climate control issues. And so, you know, that's something that, you know, even 10 years ago, we would think, you know, no, Exxon would never think about something like that, but now they are. And so, you know, uh, it just may be uh, kind of a testament that, you know, that some of the concerns that you're raising uh, are some of the concerns that, you know, large corporations are starting to think about as well. No, I hope that's true. Yeah. So, so the, the second question, which is really more about the present, uh, you know, is the following. If you were to, you know, be advising a young scholar today, you know, that person need not be in law, law and economics, but just someone who's starting their academic career today in law. Um, and I think there are lots of people in the audience uh, who would be very interested in this question. What advice would you give? Oh boy, I, um, I suppose the, uh, my first piece of advice would be not to feel 
constrained by their present agenda or present qualifications or present um, circumstances in terms of um, pursuing a, a scholarly career. As uh, you'd have noted, um, uh, you've noted, I have changed course numerous times over the course of my career in terms of the focus of my interests. Uh, so I, I don't. I, uh, so I think being open to opportunity, scholarly opportunities, being open and not being uh, single-minded, uh, sort of single-tracked, uh, maybe excessively specialized. Uh, uh, from the outset of one's career is one piece of advice. And another, and it certainly applies to me, is not to feel unduly constrained by lack of, uh, of academic uh, qualifications. One can develop these along the way, as, as I, I had to do uh, by taking the fellowship at Chicago, co-teaching courses with economists, learning on the fly, co-authoring co studies with economists. They learned from me, I learned from them. I, I think I learned more from them than they did from me. But uh, there's a way, I think, of uh, building up one's human capital and skill set over time and, and not being constrained by whatever formal qualifications one has at the start of one's career. Well, I was wondering along that line, uh, whether you could say a little bit about uh, your ability to uh, you know, move along many different intersections. So for example, you have you know, your, your traditional, uh, more theoretically based work, but you have a lot of work that's very policy oriented. And a lot of your work was you know, working directly with commissions or different branches of government. And I was just wondering, you know, to the extent that we try to think about the directionality of it, was it that your research kind of brought you to some of the policy issues or the policy issues um, kind of informed the way that you thought about your research or was it a little bit of both? No, I think it was a little bit of both. I, I think it is true that I, over the course of my career, been most engaged by uh, contemporary uh, policy issues, public policy issues of some salience. So, so that has led me to serve as a research director or in other capacities on various government task forces and commissions. But in turn, working on these task forces and commissions often led me subsequently to pursue a related scholarly agenda. But it is true that perhaps unlike some of my colleagues, I am most uh, stimulated by addressing what may be an intractable contemporary policy problem. Uh, um, and I think that's um, not not true of all scholars, and I don't claim that it should be true of all scholars, but that is, that is what tends to have motivated me over my career. Am I engaged with an issue of serious contemporary and policy importance to lots of uh, my fellow citizens or, or, or beyond, right, in the case of international policy issues? And so on that point, you know, when you think about, you know, I think you understate your vast skill set, but when you think about what law and economics can bring to uh, the study of law, like, wh what do you think is, is a central insight, right? You know, you can kind of reduce law and economics to, well, concerns about efficiency, for example, or deterrence. But, you know, I think in some ways that's overly reductionist. What do you think, uh, you know, all the law and economics skills that you have, what does it bring to bear uh, the way you look at problems? Well, at the risk of uh, being a, a bit crass, I, uh, sometimes in introducing law and economics to graduate students or whatever, I often like uh, liken uh, the legal system to a giant supermarket with different prices for different items. The prices change over time. Sometimes there are weekly specials. So I argue that one should think of the legal system as a giant pricing regime uh, where certain behaviors and certain activities uh, carry um, prices that, uh, or costs or, or penalties. Other activities or behaviors where the legal system tries to encourage, right, through uh, subsidies or tax breaks or intellectual property uh, incentive. So I think of the uh, legal system as a giant pricing mechanism putting big uh, prices on 
things that we want to discourage uh, and negative prices, i.e. subsidies or inducements or incentives on, on other activities and behaviors, just the way a supermarket operators do. So I, I know this sounds a bit crass, uh, but um, it, it would be amazing to me uh, that one could study any particular legal regime without investigating whether the incentive or disincentive properties that we've adopted are actually effective in achieving the whatever the policy objective is, which to me is not necessarily only efficiency, it could be redistribution or, or um, communitarian objectives or whatever. So we try, we try and uh, attach pri prices or costs or penalties to various things uh, in order to advance whatever this policy objective is. And I'm very eclectic about policy objectives. But how could we not ask whether the, re the regime we have chosen is or is not effective in advancing um, these policy objectives in terms of the incentive or disincentive uh, structures it has embodied? To well, uh, I think that uh, the way you talk about uh, you know, this particular point about incentives, it, it shows a certain plasticity, both in your research, but also just law and economics, they're the best you know, forms of law and economics. That is to say, you know, whatever the utility function may have been or what, whatever people are trying to optimize, the courts, judges, uh, legislatures, that's a fluid process, right? So what we think was important 50 years ago or 40 years ago, you know, in light of say your book, you know, dealing with losers, like we might have to change the way we, we determine that calculus, right? We have to think about parties who are gonna be, um, you know, left out as a result of whatever existing regime is, is set up, right? So, you know, there's gonna be kind of the maximization problem, but there's also gonna be the distributional problem. And part of what, you know, I think your research is touching upon is that like, you know, maximization is just like one element of it. And we have to think about the distributional consequences much more. And that's where, you know, that's an inherent part of law. Um, I, I, I agree completely. No, uh, you know, I've t talked about the legal system as a giant pricing system by analogy with uh, a big supermarket. Uh, but of course, uh, how people respond to the incentives or disincentives built into the legal system has actually become a very uh, um, provocative, stimulating area of recent law and economic scholarship, often called behavioral economics, where we've started to look more carefully at how people actually react to different incentives or disincentives. And, and often uh, the, the scholarship in this um, of this genre finds that people do often do not react in a way sort of these classic economic rational actor model would predict. So that leads us then to ask whether we've ad adopted in the legal system the right incentive or disincentive structure for, for whatever the policy uh, issue is at hand, right? Absolutely. Um, so I want to, in, in the time remaining, I want to ask you uh, a question about the future. And so you recently wrote a piece uh, on the past and future of law and economics. Um, law, like academia more broadly, has become increasingly interdisciplinary. And you were on the forefront of this with, with law and economics. And, and scholars, or legal scholars, I should say, have both praised and lamented this development. And so the question I have for you is, in some ways, um, to ask you to kind of predict what you think uh, the scholarship will look like. So do you think that this interdisciplinary scholarship is more of a natural progression of the way we think about the law? Or do you think that it's really just a parallel construct for which, you know, the existing traditional doctrinal way of thinking about legal questions or legal research for that matter uh, will continue and then law and economics or law and history or law and philosophy and all these other law and types of ways of thinking about the law um, is just gonna run in parallel? Or again, do you think that it's part of this broader convergence towards interdisciplinary research? I tend to think uh, along the latter, latter lines, that is the uh, just straight black letter scholarship, you know, of the doctrinal scholarship, both as taught or as written about will become uh, more and more marginal. Maybe, maybe this, this is uh, 
um, a provocative uh, position to take. Uh, so I think we're going to see a much more, a more uh, much more, a stronger focus on various areas of interdisciplinary scholarship, not just law and economics, law and history, law and philosophy, law and political theory, law and sociology, et cetera, et cetera, criminal, uh, critical race theory, uh, law and gender studies. So, um, so I think uh, somebody who just says, I want to teach uh, the nuts and bolts uh, of whatever the area of law is, or that's all I want to write about. I think it has a very limited uh, scholarly horizon. Well, it's interesting. If you go back to the early 90s, there was this debate between uh, Harry Edwards, who uh, I think at the time he had just joined the bench. So he was an academic uh, at the University of Michigan and Richard Posner, who of course, uh, both an academic and a jurist. Um, Harry Edwards was lamenting that uh, even in, as early as the 1990s, scholarship had become more in a interdisciplinary rather. And he thought that that was, um, that was problematic, right? That we were somehow, the academy was um, not properly training the next generation of lawyers uh, to which Richard Posner said, uh, well, as you can imagine, he took the opposite take. He said, well, actually, you know, that's not, you know, he didn't think that that was actually problematic at all. And he looked at all the ways in which in, you know, his area of expertise, law and economics was informing the way that we thought about you know, these vast areas of law, whether there is antitrust or whether there's contracts or even just torts, for example. So um, it's, it's interesting that, you know, the debate is still ongoing 30 years later. Right? And it, 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 it happened even before uh, Edwards and Posner were writing uh, in, in this type of debate. Um, but, but, you know, it's... it's well, I think, you know, the autonomy of law theorists, and we have a number of uh, outstanding uh, scholars in that genre in our own faculty, the autonomy of law theorists and contract law, tort law, I uh, would say, I uh, would argue, that uh, they're not concerned with the consequences of their body of law out there in the real world, that the law has its own internal coherence, a Cartesian or Kantian logic, and what impact it has out there uh, in the real world is not a uh, uh, primary concern to them. Uh, I respect that line of scholarship, but it's not one that, frankly, has attracted me. I, I'm, I'm always concerned about the impact of law out there on real people in the real world. So, you know, one of the uh, one of the many impressive things is that uh, about you is that you've been able to. Uh, develop these large contributions in, in many different areas of the law, and yet you're always uh, thinking about the next interesting project. And so, you know, again, this will be my last question, but what is the, what is your new project? Uh, well, I'm thinking ab uh, about a couple or uh, two or three trade issues that I find intractable. One is how the hell do we get vaccines both produced and distributed across the world, right? I mean, I realize that there's a number of dimensions to this problem, but a major dimension is trade policy. How do we prevent countries from hoarding uh, vaccines, restricting exports, not only of vaccines, but key, in, uh, key inputs? How do we uh, d d disseminate the technology more broadly across, across more countries? Uh, there's a number of dimensions to this problem, but trade policy is an important dimension. So I, I'm worrying about that. Um, I'm working on uh, working on that issue. Another quite different trade issue is what should countries outside of China do in terms of trade policy. Um, with respect to the use of forced labor in China, um, the Uyghur, Uyghur uh, minority, right? Should we ban uh, products imported from China made with forced Uyghur labor or not? Uh, is this possible or legal under current international trade law? Even if it could, uh, even if it's legal, is it likely to be effective? Are there other more effective ways of demonstrating our, uh, our uh, opposition to uh, these labor practices? 
So I think there's lots of contemporary uh, contemporary uh, issues out there that that I'm I'm, I'm skirting around. Another trade issue is the uh, subsidies, and even the uh, the U.S. China trade conflict largely revolves, has revolved around allegations that the Chinese government and various instrumental, instrumentalities of the government or the Communist Party in all kinds of obscure and opaque ways subsidize uh, production of products that uh, are traded in international markets. And this is an unfair form of trade. This is an extremely uh, intractable issue to figure out who who's subsidizing whom and to what extent and what kind of legal rules could feasibly be negotiated internationally to constrain at least the more egregious forms of distorting trade distorting subsidies. This sounds technical, but it's, it's at the core of the US-China trade conflict. Do you think on, on that last point, do you think that um, these these challenges fall more along the lines of legal pro legal challenges or or legal problems or political problems. And to the extent that you think these are more inherently political problems, what tools do you think the legal you know essentially what what tools can law bring to solving these political problems? Well, I, I, it is true they're all of the above, right? They're political, they're economic, they're legal. Uh, uh, but you know, I teach international trade law. I emphasize law. Um, uh, but uh, situated in a broader political and economic uh, context. Um, and we have we have a, a vast and complex bodies of multilateral and uh, regional trade laws, right? Uh, in, in regional trade agreements and the World Trade Organization. So at some point, at some point, uh, lot, lots of these issues that I mentioned, have to be framed or, or incorporated into some kind of legal discipline. So, so is this best done multilaterally? Is it best done regionally through regional trade agreements? What kinds of institutions are capable of investigating complaints of violations of the rules? What kinds of sanctions are likely to be effective where com complaints are, are found to be uh, justified? These are important legal and institutional issues, right? And, and we should be better at that, at those issues than um, economists or political theorists, right? Trying to figure out what is likely to be a, an effective set of legal disciplines, what is likely to be an effective set of institutional arrangements for, for investigating allegations of violations and enforcing, uh, uh, enforcing compliance. These are profoundly legal and institutional issues. Excellent, thank you. So I want to leave time for um, for the Q the Q and A period before I know I can see already questions are appearing in uh, in the box. So um, why don't we uh, why don't we open up to uh, Adriana Robertson and. Uh, let me just jump in very briefly before we do that and introduce Adriana Robertson, who will uh, moderate the, the Q&A. Um, Adriana is the Honorable Justice Frank Yakubuchi Chair in Capital Markets Regulation and an Associate Professor of Law and Finance with tenure at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law and also at the Rotman School of Management. In other words, we have here another chair named after a giant, in this case, helped by Adriana. She's also the head uh, of research and policy at the U of T Capital Markets Institute. Her research focuses on the intersection between law and finance. Its impact is already remarkable within academia and beyond. Her recent work has been featured, for example, in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Globe and Mail, and the Financial Times. Adriana, over to you. Thank you uh, so much. So I'm just here as a vessel uh, to pass the questions from the audience on to Michael. Um, and the first question uh, that we have in our queue uh, is asking about the Law Commission of Canada. So uh, the federal minister of justice 
is planning to reinstate the commission. And so the question to you, Michael, is how would you advise him on thinking about the who and the what and how of the commission's work? And in particular, why should he look for someone aware of law and economics? And how would that knowledge inform the scope and approach of the commission? Boy, that's a good question. Um, and I'm sure the questioner is aware that the Law Commission of Canada has had a checkered history, right? I, I, um, I, I don't remember the details. It was created 20 or 30 years ago, then it was uh, terminated, then it was recreated a number of years later, then terminated again. So this is really the third coming, so to speak. Um, I think, uh, you know, provincial law reform commissions probably have had a somewhat better track record. I think one issue is are these commissions best, both, uh, both uh, populated mostly by lawyers and mostly focused on what I would call more technical areas of law, you know, trying to sort out statutes, uh, inconsistent uh, statutes of limitations or personal property security law, at very arcane and technical areas of law that don't have huge policy or political salience, but are important to uh, lots of people, right? So, so th this would argue for a relatively focused mandate and a commission mostly populated by lawyers. Now, of course, this is inconsistent with my view that, uh, you know, law and is the wave of the future. But if you, once you, once the law commission is set up on that basis, you can't confine it only to lawyers and you can't confine its mandate only to, let me call them technical areas of law. But here, this is where the government has run into trouble in the in the past. They say, well, we set up this commission. Now they're running wild on all kinds of politically sensitive issues, same-sex marriage, uh, proportional uh, representation in the House of Commons. They think these issues are important. What the hell uh, business of they deciding that uh, these uh, issues are worth uh, uh, prominent attention? So uh, the government's kind of caught uh, between a rock and a hard place there. That is giving the commission a very broad mandate, maybe a highly interdisciplinary membership and telling them do whatever you study, whatever you like. But, you know, governments are going to be nervous about this, right? Um, or I suppose another third option would be give it a broad mandate, uh, an interdisciplinary composition, but only take on uh, issues that the government remits to them, right? Don't don't have any uh, sort of self-initiating uh, capacity. And I think there may be some virtue in that last option. So so the government doesn't feel that, that it's lost control of the policy, its policy agenda. But it still gets the benefits of the interdisciplinarity. Right. We also, we have a, a question here from a former student of yours uh, from your law and business in a global economy class. Uh, and the student mentions uh, that you have historically been a fervent defender of globalization and that, that sounds right. Um, and the question is whether you still hold that view having regard to recent nationalism and backlash such as Brexit and Trumpism. And I suppose we could probably come up with others. And I would just maybe supplement that question by asking, uh, has that in any way, other than of course your work on dealing with losers, um, have, have there been other implications to your thinking from those backlashes? Uh, look, I think the honest answer from my part, going back uh, my 30 odd years, is I'm kind of a committed, by instinct, a committed free trader. Not without qualifications, right? I've already talked about forced labor and talked about how we can get uh, vaccines distributed rapidly around the world, all of which call all of these challenges call for all kinds of refinements to a basic free trade position. But the idea that 
every, every country in the world would be better off in a state of complete autarky of self-sufficiency. It strikes me as so bizarre, I can hardly imagine what that world would look like. Right? We only have to look at what we're wearing, what we're looking at in terms of computers, what we're driving, uh, what we're eating. The idea that we could become self-sufficient and uh, and uh, sort of disconnect from the rest of the world strikes me as uh, a, a fantasy. Uh, so that's my starting premise that we gain a great deal from a relatively open trading system, but most of the contentious issues are around, are around the around the edges, right? What should we do about countries that engage in unfair labor standards? What should we do about countries that engage in unfair forms of subsidization of their firms? Should we abolish uh, intellectual property rights and vaccines, uh, at least for, on a temporary basis in order to encourage uh, uh, manufacturers in developing countries to develop their own uh, vaccine? These are all important uh, issues of controversy around the core of a kind of a commitment to free trade. So I, I, I don't want to represent myself as some kind of blinkered and um, sort of ideological proponent of free trade, but my starting premise is the world would be immeasurably poorer if we all, every country opted for a state of autarky or self-sufficiency. I, I find this world unimaginable. I, I drive a Japanese car. I have a Korean tractor up here at our farm. I don't know where, where this computer comes from. I'm sure it, I know it's not made here. And I know the vaccine shot I got a, a few weeks ago isn't made here, right? Um, so people who tell me uh, that they're, they're anti-globalizers, they need to tell me a good deal more about exactly what they're proposing. Well, thank you. Um, so in some ways, you're saying that you're a pro-globalization out of necessity because the the alternative is so much worse. And then it just comes down to how we move forward from there. Well, but to link up to a point that uh, Albert raised, right? My book, Dealing with Losers, I have a long chapter in that book on well, losers from trade, all these folks that have lost jobs in the manufacturing sector in the U.S. in the, in the, uh, in the face of a massive increase in um, imported, Jap mainly Japanese, uh, Chinese manufactured goods. We, we can't ignore these losers, right? And just to say, well, we're, on balance, we're better off. Uh, who cares about the... the couple of million folk who've lost their jobs as a result of import competition. I care about them deeply. Uh, but my response would be, we need a much stronger social safety net, much, uh, much uh, more uh, effective active labor market policies to help uh, these folk uh, get back into the labor, labor market, as opposed to simply shutting down trade, which I think is going to impose vastly more costs uh, on um, the rest of us. Well, I'm getting a note here saying that we've come to the end of our Q&A time, unfortunately, but thank you so much, Michael. Um, yeah. And the, the long queue that we didn't have a chance to get to is just a testament to how interesting and exciting um, the work that you're still doing, I think, is to everyone. Thank you, Adriana. Well, thank you, Michael and Albert, and thank you, um, Adriana, for moderating. Now, as many of you will know, the Faculty of Law enjoys a prime spot on the U of T campus um, in the heart of downtown Toronto, opposite Queen's Park. And although the Jackman Law Building and the historic Flavel House and Falconer Hall are quiet now, we are hopeful for a return to campus this, this fall, where once again, we welcome students, faculty, staff, and the buzz of activity that resonates throughout um, all these spaces. Now, one of our most significant spaces is the Solarium in Falconer Hall. It's a place where faculty council meets to share new initiatives, uh, where we have lively debates and vote on important issues. It's also served as one of Michael's favorite places to deliver lectures. 
Well, thanks to the generosity of Dean Emeritus Ron Daniels and Joanne Rosen, I am pleased to announce the upcoming restoration and naming of the Michael J. Trebilco Solarium. Thank you so much, Ron and Joanne. The significance of naming a chair, a program, and the solarium cannot be understated. Together, they represent an investment in scholarship, research, teaching, collaboration, and student engagement. Now, along with a sneak peek of our plans for the Michael J. Trebilco Solarium, please join me in thanking all of the generous donors. Wonderful. Thank you to everyone. And in particular, it is now my distinct privilege to introduce Dean Emeritus Ronald J. Daniels to bring our afternoon to a close. Ron now serves as the 14th president of Johns Hopkins University, and under his leadership, Johns Hopkins continues to expand its preeminence in education, patient care, and innovative discovery. A law and economics scholar, Ron Daniels is the author or co-author of seven books and dozens of scholarly articles, including some jointly with Michael, at the intersections of law, economics, development, and public policies in areas such as corporate and securities law, social and economic regulation, and the role of law and legal institutions in promoting third world development. Ron Daniels is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. He received a Carnegie Corporation of New York Academic Leadership Award in 2015 and was named a member of the Order of Canada in 2016. Before joining Johns Hopkins, he was provost and professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania and of course, Dean and James Marshall Torrey Dean's chair at our faculty where he also earned his, his JD. Ron, welcome and thank you for your unwavering support and generosity. Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Yuta. Um, some three decades ago, soon after the Bor Alaska Library opened, uh, I recall very vividly a conversation that Michael and I had with Rob Pritchard 
Michael and I were complimenting Rob on his success in securing the new library, something that the faculty had been yearning for for eons, eons in fact. And Rob was nonchalant. Yes, the new library was great, but as every university leader knows, what makes a great university is not bricks and mortar, but the people who inhabit it, the ideas they develop, the students whom they inspire. Human, not physical capital, is the coin of the realm. It is a simple insight that in the many years since I've never lost sight of nor ceased to appreciate. And so it's somewhat ironic that when Joanne and I approached Ed Yakabuchi, hoping to do something that would help to recognize and mark Michael's immense contributions to our law school, to our discipline, to our profession, and to public policy more generally in Canada and beyond, we specifically sought to name the solarium a place, not a program or scholarship that would be more directly tied to human capital in his honor. After all, Michael exemplifies, as many have said throughout this program today, in such a vivid and dramatic manner, the best of the many gifted people who populate the Collegium. Breathtaking and humbling scholarly and pedagogical productivity, unquenchable, unquenchable uh, intellectual curiosity, astonishing intellectual ecumenism, boundless generosity of spirit, a mentor extraordinaire, and of course, a deep and unflagging commitment to our law school and to our university. He is, and this, both Joanna and I can say with complete confidence, one of the most extraordinary human beings we have ever met. That so many of us at this gathering today can say that we have been fortunate to debate, work, dream, and scheme with Michael is indeed a treasured blessing. So given all this, why opt to honor Michael with a space? And I think Yuda's comments a moment, a moment ago alluded to it. The answer of course lies in the special meaning that this space has in our law school. From the time that Joanne and I were students here and later when I joined the faculty, the Slarium has been the place where the most important debates over the nature of law and legal institutions were hosted and nourished at the law school. This is the place where the law school's eminence as an institution devoted to rigorous interrogation of the purchase of so many different approaches to law was secured in legal theory, law and economics, feminism, legal history, and more. This is the place where the law school regularly honors the spirit of shared intellectual endeavor between faculty and students in the many advanced seminars that are part of our curriculum. Indeed, over the years, this is the place where Michael's storied breadth of substantive legal expertise was exemplified in the many different seminars he led, contract theory, law and economics, transitions in former, Soviet, uh, former communist countries, law and development, trade law and theory, competition law, the reinvention of the welfare state, immigration law and policy, and more. And finally, uh, this is a place where the faculty's core governing body, faculty council, meets, and where we have, over the years, found ways to advance our mission in a manner that has been ambitious and bold, but equally true to the ideals of collegiality, intellectual pluralism, prudence, and mutual respect. The Slarium stands, then, as a singular place in our school that is filled with the light of reason, the possibility of progress, the spirit of ecumenism and the commitment to collegiality and friendship. It is in short, a place that comes as close as any to capturing the magnificent and ever so rare magic of Michael. Michael, Joanne and I are truly thrilled to see the university mark this space for you. After all, dear friend, you have in your inimitable way done so much to make the institution a place of great distinction. This room, we hope, will in the years to come inspire those who follow in your footsteps to honor, embrace, and emulate the example you have so generously given to us and to them. Uh, we love you and we thank you so very much for all that you have done to make our lives and our institution so much better. To you and Jan, congratulations, dear friend.